Well, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Somebody say, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, God is good. And all the time, thank you, Franco. Thank you for that. God is good. And all the time, praise the Lord. Glory. Oh, it's a good day. It's a good day in the house of the Lord. It might be windy outside. It might be stormy outside, but we have a peace that passes understanding on the inside, right? Come on, did you hear the word from Vivian about the word? If we are founded and grounded on the word of God, we can have a peace that passes understanding. We can have a confidence that no matter what the enemy throws against us, no matter how much he does the haka ah, and thumps his chest, that we can turn and praise the Lord and know that God has got our back, right? Hallelujah. It is time for the church to rise up in faith. Where does faith come from? Come on, church. Where does faith come from? Faith comes from the Word of God. I can tell that Connor is in Bible school. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. If we will have faith in the Word of God, if we will truly believe the Word of God, nothing will be impossible for us. All things that God has given to us will manifest at the appropriate and proper time. And we will walk out our destiny, and it doesn't matter what the enemy does or doesn't do. He can't stop us if we will have faith in the Word of God. I pray today from this message that we go out of here with a renewed faith in the Word of God. That we take ourselves a whole lot less seriously, and we take the Lord a whole lot more seriously. We take ourselves way too serious. We take our feelings and our perceptions and our ideas about what is good and what is not good. We take that way too seriously. And sometimes we take the word of God way too lackadaisically, way too flippantly, way too, oh, well, yeah, that's what the, yeah, that's, that's, that's nice. But it doesn't apply to me. No, it, it does apply to me. The word of God does apply to me. I praise God that the word applies to us, right? The word that says that he came into his own and his own received him not, but to as many as received him, to them he gave power. Everybody say power. Power, power to become the children of God. Praise God that that word applies to me. We're going to look at a bunch of word here today. Go figure. I just love the word, and uh, you're always going to get a full meal of the word whenever I'm speaking because it's the only thing that we can cling to. It's the only thing that is true. And if we don't have the word in our sermons, then it's just my ideas, right? But if we have the word, we have something sure and steadfast that we can hold on to that is a light that shines in darkness. And I pray, Father, let's pray, for this church this morning, Lord, that you would give us above all things a love for the truth. Lord, if we don't want to know the truth, then all the preaching in the world won't help us. And even your word won't help us if we don't want to know the truth, if we don't love the truth, Lord God. We want to love the truth. I pray, Father, right now in the mighty name of Jesus, that every carnal mindset that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, every fleshly perception Every gravitation toward gratifying the lusts of the flesh, Lord, would be stripped away from us and that we would desire to live in your reality, that we would desire to know your love for us and to know your perspective on our lives and ways in which we are not lining up with your word. I pray that your light would shine in here this morning, would bring clarity, would bring understanding so that we might repent, so that we might align ourselves according to the word of God, that when we stand before you on that day, we might not be dismayed and not be shocked, but be able to hear you say, well done, good and faithful servants. Lord, I pray for every ear in this place that it would supernaturally be opened. The spiritual ears of our understanding would be opened and the spiritual eyes would be able to see the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, that we might know the hope to which we are called and that we might take you at your word. In Jesus' mighty name, and everyone said, amen. amen. Praise the Lord. Do you like the, the bulletin cover? I think Nick did a really good job there. Anybody can read the fine print? Those of you who, you know, still have really good eyesight. Can you read the fine print? <coughs> it looks, 
it looks like all the names of the actors typically that you have on a cover of a movie. That's what that's supposed to rep represent. But it's actually scripture. It's actually uh, scripture. We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands, he is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God will be made complete in them. Love for God will be made complete in them, bears repeating. Some of you will uh, recognize that in other translations, which says, by this we know that we have been made accepted in the beloved, and it says, by this we assure our hearts before him, we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. The one who fears has not been made perfect in love, but perfect love casts out fear. And if you were part of this church back when we were doing foundations, and if you went through that, you understand that the love that is being spoken of there is speaking about our love for God, not his love for us. Perfect love casts out fear. If it's God's love, God loves the whole world, and he's perfect, so why are people afraid? It's not speaking about God's love. If you read the whole book of 1 John, it's speaking about our love for God as evidenced by our obedience to God. Listen, love for God and obedience to God are indistinguishable. You cannot say you love him if you do not obey him. Now, you might have all sorts of feelings, but feelings are not love. Choice is love. Action is love. The Bible says that Christ laid, it says, in this was the love of God manifest in that God sent his son Jesus to be the propitiation or atoning sacrifice for our sins. No greater love has any man than this, but that he would feel all warm and mushy toward his friends. No, that's not your translation? No, it says, no greater love has any man than this, but that he would lay down his life for his friends, that he would sacrifice of himself for his friends. That could be a simple, small sacrifice, giving some, somebody something, maybe some money when it happens to be your last five bucks, and it could be martyrdom. It could be completely laying down your life for your friends. Love for God is indistinguishable from obedience to him. Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. Praise the Lord. So, <clears throat> the bucket list. Anybody seen that movie? Oh, come on, be honest. Anybody seen that movie? Any Okay, some people have seen it twice. All right. So the premise in the bucket list is you have Morgan Freeman and Jack Nicholson. And by the way, I'm not recommending anybody go see the movie. I'm just telling you. I saw it a long time ago, but I'm, I'm just filling you in on the, on the plot and, and the concept. So Morgan Freeman is dying of cancer and or some sort of bad illness. I think it's cancer. And so is Jack Nicholson. And uh, Jack Nicholson is fantastically rich. He, he built hospitals and, uh, and stuff, and now he's in a hospital, and he wants his own room. But his, his, uh, his whole principle before that was two beds to a room, no exceptions, and so now he's stuck with his own rule. And he doesn't want to be in the same room with Morgan Freeman, who is um, a black man. Jack Nicholson obviously is white, and he wants out of there. But in the context of them arguing and, and having discussion, they begin to develop something of an affinity for one another. And Morgan Freeman is writing things down on a piece of yellow note paper, and then he gets tired or frustrated or disillusioned with that, and he throws it on the floor, and Jack Nicholson picks it up and starts reading through it, and, and then Morgan Freeman notices what he's doing <coughs> and says, hey, give me that back. He says, come on, you threw it on the floor. What is this? And he starts reading it out loud, and then Morgan Freeman explains, okay, well, it was a concept I heard when I was a young man, and this teacher was talking about making a list of things that you would like to do before you kick the bucket. Things that you would like to accomplish, experiences you would like to have before you die. And so the story goes that um, Morgan Freeman's going, well, there's no point now, I'm, I'm dying. And Jack Nicholson says, hey, our cancer's temporarily at least in remission for both of us, even though the, the prognosis is not good, but let's do this. And Morgan Freeman's like, no, no, no. He's like, come on. Now you have a chance to do this. Money's no option, or is no, um, it's no problem. I've got all the money in the world. We can go anywhere and do whatever we want. Let's, you know, and so Jack Nicholson takes Morgan Freeman's list, which has some things on there like um, see something truly majestic, you know, uh, um, get to know a perfect stranger and some other what we might term altruistic or noble goals, and Jack Nicholson starts to write in 
you know, kiss the prettiest girl in the world, skydive, and all of these other things, right? So anyway, the, the story goes that they embark and they go, these two old, old, uh, old guys, <laughs> I was going to say something else, and uh, that's what they are, right? So, so they head out there and, uh, and, and they're doing all of these life experiences, and along the way they're learning things about themselves and about one another and about life. And uh, at the end of the movie, well, I won't spoil it for you if you haven't seen it and you decide you absolutely must. So it's become a common term within our culture. Oh, that's on my bucket list. And for, you know, most of the people in our culture who've seen the movie, they understand what that means. And even if they haven't seen the movie, they still have a sense of what that means, you know, things we would like to do. And so, you know, I've, I've, I've put down a, a few things here that I can imagine that people would like to do. Let me just find my... Uh, um, skydive. Well, you know, that, that's kind of a fun thing. How many here have skydived? Besides Mr. Mike Carey, at what age did you skydive, Mike? About 20 years ago. So when he was 60, Mike went skydiving. And uh, <coughs> he would not be the oldest person to do that, but he's still a hero in my book. Uh, you know, as uh, Jack Nicholson said, he wants to kiss the most beautiful girl in the world. I've already done that, so I do it on a daily basis. <laughs> Own or at least drive a particular car. You know, some people are like, man, I really want to get, I would love to get, you know, I think in the movie it was a Shelby something Mustang that uh, even Morgan Freeman, that was one of his goals. Um, achieve a certain level or degree of education. Maybe that's on your bucket list. Maybe you're like, I really want to, you know, I, I want to finish my degree. I, I want to get a bachelor's degree. Or maybe you have one and you're like, I want to get a master's. Or maybe you have one and you're like, I want to get a doctorate. I want to get a PhD in something. Um, seems a pretty noble goal. Make a certain amount of money. Some people are like, I want to make a million dollars. You know, and I, some people say, I want to make a billion dollars. There's a lot fewer of those. <coughs> pay off a mortgage. Is that on anybody's bucket list? You want to, you'd like to pay off your mortgage before you kick the bucket. <coughs> so you don't say, you know, happy day, son and daughter. Here's a $100,000 debt you now owe. <laughs> Travel to a certain place or a certain number of places. How many of you have got travel goals? You would like to go somewhere, you know, you haven't been before, or you'd like to go there again, or you'd like to, I don't know, circumnavigate the globe. I had the uh, good fortune of being able to do that uh, four times before I was 17. Of course, I was really small, and I didn't understand the significance. It was just a lot of airports and carrying luggage and bags and, and trying to sleep um, on the floor in front of my parents' feet back when there was actually space in airplanes, remember? <laughs> we used to be able to sleep on the floor between my mom and dad's feet and the next row of chairs. Can't do that anymore. <laughs> uh, achieve a level of skill in a sport or hobby. I recently took up disc golf, and my whole focus in disc golf was I've got to beat Marika <laughs> because, you know, she's beaten me at tennis, so I have to beat her at disc golf, and so uh, I'm already there. I can cross that off. No. <laughs> I still like playing it a little bit. Yes, I know she was pregnant. Don't remind the people there, Brian. <laughs> hey, still counts, okay? <laughs> Cross that off. Okay, I beat a pregnant woman, nine months pregnant. She should have been pregnant when I played her tennis. <laughs> Eat something exotic or unusual. <clears throat> Something expensive, maybe go to an expensive restaurant. Um, be the best in your sphere of influence, your group, your city, your country, or maybe even in the world at something. Be the best. Um, accomplish something really difficult, like Tough mutter. You know, that's on some people's bucket list. I want to do that. In fact, I believe we might have people in the congregation here who've done Tough mutter, And uh, that is probably a really good feeling to... I, I know Marie has, and... Um, and I believe there were some others, but to accomplish something very difficult like that and then be able to go, I did it. I got to the end, and usually they're exhausted and maybe sore. Uh, learn to play an instrument well. You know, that is an accomplishment. That, and, and especially if, you're, if you didn't take lessons when you were young or a teenager or something, and later on in life you decide, I, I want to learn to play an instrument well. Accomplishing that um, feels meaningful. Set a record of some kind, and there's a bazillion records you can set on YouTube. And on, on Guinness Book of World Records, absolutely meaningless things like how many toothpicks you can fit in your mouth at the same time and uh, without, you know, piercing your cheeks or how many you can get up your nose or, or just the most ridiculous things. But for some people, they want to do that. 
So, <clears throat> say, well, how does, this, how does this apply to us? And how does it apply? Where's, where's the continuity? Where's the coherence with the topic we have been discussing now since January 1st? Does anybody please, if you love your pastor, somebody please remember what is the theme that we have been talking about since January 1st? And Ken has preached on it, and I've preached on it. Uh, that was actually before January 1st. That's very good. But since January 1st, we have been speaking on the subject of... You're killing me, you people. <laughs> yes, submission to authority, but lawlessness. We've been speaking about lawlessness and the spirit of lawlessness that is in the world. And I'm going to tell you that by the end of today's message, we're going to have an understanding of how this spirit of lawlessness is connected to bucket lists. Well, what? <laughs> no, trust me. So let's start in the beginning. Go to your, in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 3. And we're going to tie this in as well to what I started with, which is the Word. The Word of God. The Word of God and loving the truth. Oh, people, if we don't love the truth, then we might as well just leave right now and go out and fill our bellies with whatever sweet and fatty and creamy confections would delight us because there is no hope for us if we do not love the truth. We must love the truth. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say? In the New King James it says, has the Lord indeed said? Did God really say, you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. He didn't actually say that last part. He just said don't eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. And then the Satan responds and says, you will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The first thing that the enemy is always going to do whenever he comes against us is ask the question or get you to pose the question in your mind, did God really say? He's going to shed, he's going to cast doubt on God's word. Did God really say? Are, are you sure that's what he really said? I mean, as, as, as Frank Peretti says, uh, like, how can you be sure, certain what God really said? I mean, it's been translated so many times. How can you be sure that that's actually what he really said? Yeah, but did he really mean that? How many think God means exactly what he says? So then, if we read the word of God with, with the belief and with the conviction that God really means what he says, then I'm going to suggest to you that that will have a major impact on our lives and how we live and how we walk out our dreams and our destinies and our desires and all of those things before him in light of what he has really said. Matthew chapter 25, turn there. Matthew chapter 25 and verse 31. It is important to have goals. Some of my closest friends every year, they will sit down and, and they will go over their goals. Um, and some of those goals involve family. Some of those goals involve health. Um, you know, goals for physical fitness and just just you know, maybe losing some pounds, some weight, or, or keeping the weight off if you've lost it already, um, levels of fitness, other goals involve um, things that they want to do, you know, um, goals that they have, financial goals, we want to pay off this loan or this debt, or, or we want to save to be able to go on this trip, and I don't mean to say this morning that any one of those goals are bad, they're not. Those are, those are good goals to do. It's important to have goals. If we don't have goals and if we don't set ourselves goals, 
then we're pretty much guaranteed not to hit them, the goals that we don't set, right? If you don't shoot for something, then you won't hit it. However, I'm going to submit today that, that there are some very specific and measurable things that the Lord has given us which should be on all of our bucket lists. Matthew 25 and verse 31. When the Son of Man, Jesus is speaking to his disciples, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them from one another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you? Hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to the one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away. <coughs> into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. That is a sober scripture, is it not? Matthew chapter 20, 18, we're going to go through a number of scriptures here, and then we're going to talk about them as a whole. Matthew 20, 18, verse 18, uh, Jesus has been raised from the dead and is speaking with his disciples before his ascension into heaven. And Jesus came, verse 18, and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, or behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age." Amen. John chapter 14 and verse 15. Jesus is speaking to his disciples and he says, If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him. For he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. A little while longer and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you will live also. At that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. Again, we see the, the fact that you cannot make a distinction between love for God and obedience to God. The measure of our love for God is evident by whether or not we are obeying his word. And he says, in another place in Scripture, he says, my commands are not burdensome. I'll tell you what is burdensome is when we want something other than what he's commanding us and we're torn in between. When we want to serve him, but we want what this world provides or what it gives or our agenda or achieving our goals, and achieving those goals is then going to be done at the expense of achieving his goals, that is burdensome. But if our heart is completely focused on him, and our love is for him, and we are focused on living in a way that will please him, that when we come before him, we might receive the commendation, then his commands are not burdensome. There's nobody more miserable than a, black, than a, than a backslidden Christian. 
somebody who has tasted the good word of God, someone who's known the truth, experienced the love of God, perhaps healing, deliverance, all of these things, the power of his Holy Spirit, and is being pulled back toward the things of the world. I, I, uh, um, one young man came to me after um, temporarily going backwards for a little bit, and he said this. He said, I had no idea my vomit would taste so bad. <laughs> you know the scripture that says that a dog goes back to his vomit. That's exactly what it is. Living for ourselves is that disgusting. And when we've tasted the goodness of God, and yet we're finding ourselves pulled back to those things, it's grieving the spirit that God has made to dwell within us. And it does not produce the satisfaction. Where was I here? So, um, verse 21, he who has my commandments (coughs) and keeps them, it is he who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. And that sounds like conditional love. There's two kinds of love which God gives to the world. The first is the unconditional love of God, which is granted to the whole world, John 3.16, for God so loved the world, the whole world, that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. People say, well, I just don't know if God really loves me. No, you shouldn't say that. All you should do is read the word and know, not because you feel it, but because you believe it, that God loves you. Because it says, in this, the love of God was manifest, made real, tangible, touchable, verifiable to the world in that he sent Jesus Christ to die for our sins. The way that we know 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 that God loves us is because Jesus came. And any time the devil begins to whisper to you that maybe God doesn't love you, you can say, no, get out of here. Of course God loves me. Jesus came. It's not about how I feel if I'm feeling warm and cozy and fuzzy right now. Jesus came to die for me. That way I know that God loves me. But what we see right here in in, in the book of John chapter 14 is another love that is being spoken of. Again, for those of you who went through foundations, you will understand this as the habitational love of God versus the unconditional love of God. The unconditional love of God is genuine and true, but let me tell you something, it scares me. You say, really? The unconditional love of God scares you? How does it scare you? Because God loves the world unconditionally, and that will not stop him from sending the majority of them to hell. Right? Come on, church. The Bible says, wide is the gate that leads to destruction, and many there be that go that way. And yet we know that God loves every single person that will ultimately end up in hell. He still loves them. I don't understand that, but I don't need to understand it. I just need to believe it. But what it says here in 1 John is it says, in verse 21, He who has my commandments and keeps them, that one loves me. (coughs) And he who loves me in this manner, he who obeys me, will... (coughs) Be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. So Judas, not Judas Iscariot, the other uh, disciples, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus repeats himself for emphasis. And he says in verse 23, Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. See, this is the balance, it's the divine tension between the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man. God loves us, God has chosen those of us who believe in him, scripture says, from before the foundations of the world, and yet that does not mean that you are one iota less responsible to respond and reciprocate his love by loving him back, and loving him back means listening to what he says and obeying him. And not asking the question or allowing the enemy to pose the question in your mind, did God really say? Did God really say? Which is the first tactic of the enemy to begin to draw us back from actually living out the faith that God has made possible. Listen, it doesn't matter if you haven't been to Bible school. It doesn't matter if you weren't uh, um, uh, born as a missionary kid. It doesn't matter if you got saved yesterday. God has made through the power of his Holy Spirit and the dispensation of his grace, he has made it possible for every single person here doesn't matter your gender, doesn't matter your IQ, doesn't matter your social status, your financial status. He has made it possible for every single one of us to draw near to him. 
to come into intimacy with him. Brian is up here this morning, and he is praying for people to receive healing. Is this scripture? Good. Just want to make sure we know that. Yes, it is scripture. The Bible says you'll lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. So we have faith to pray for people and expect God to do a miracle right as we're sitting in here and heal wrists, you know, in, in, in Murray and, and, and necks and my sister over here and all sorts of things in, in, in Vivian. We have faith to believe that God will sovereignly, miraculously, and supernaturally bring about a healing. But do we have faith to believe that we can quit looking at porn? Do we have faith to believe that we can stop being impatient that we can stop gossiping, that we can stop not submitting to authority in whatever way the Holy Spirit convicts us that we are not submitting to authority. See, it's one thing because we want to believe that the Lord can heal us, but we might not want to believe that God can actually be Lord of our appetites, that God can actually be Lord in the areas where we're undisciplined and we're, and, and we're just kind of doing what feels good to us. But God is not mocked. God, the Bible says, let God be true and every man a liar. What that scripture means is if the whole world says it's white and God says it's black, it's black. God's word is true. And we will know that the moment we step into eternity and, and, and we see his glory and we experience his majesty, we're instantly going to have the benefit of being able to look back over our lives. And I say benefit, but in, for, for many people it will be a huge burden. And we're instantly going to be able to see how we, we, we gave in to that subtle whisper of did God really say? And how we excused ourselves from believing and trusting and obeying his word when he was speaking. But that's why I say it's so important. That's why I pray for myself on my knees with tears, and I pray for us as a church that the most important thing, church, is that we would love the truth. If we don't love the truth, there's no hope for us. We must love the truth. Um, Paul says this, and by the way, I want to let you know that there, it is possible to come to a place where you are conscious of no sin. It is not only possible, it is what Christ sets as the standard. He says, be perfect even as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now you're like, well, I can't do that. Of course I can. That, if you've been thinking that you have to be perfect all on your lonesome, oh, please let me take that burden off of you this morning. <laughs> you cannot be perfect. But in falling deeper and deeper in love with him and in believing what he says, he will perfect you. The Bible says, he will perfect those things which concern me. And Paul, who writes at the beginning of his ministry, am I not also an apostle? And then begins to mature and says, well, I'm the least of the apostles. To, well, I'm the least of all men. To, I'm the chiefest of sinners. <laughs> you notice the progression? <laughs> the more mature we become, the less confidence we have in our flesh or anything of ourselves. But at the end of his life, he says what? He says this, I have fought a good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. And there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. And then he adds this. And not for me only, but also for all those who have loved his appearing. Do you know what that scripture means? It means those who have loved the truth. Because Jesus is the truth. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. So when the entrance of the truth comes into our life, it reveals what is out of alignment. It reveals what is not in accordance with a heavenly reality. And it doesn't feel good a lot of the time. You say, well, well no, no, that's not my Jesus. Actually, if your Jesus is different than that, then he's different than the Jesus in the Bible. If we read about Jesus' interactions with his disciples, yes, there was nurture, yes, there was encouragement, but there was an awful lot of admonition. There was an awful lot of, oh, how long shall I bear with you, speaking to his own disciples? Oh, you of little faith, get behind me, Satan, he said to Peter. You have set your mind on what man wants, not what God wants. There was constant challenging. Hey, Jesus, that people in that city, man, they, did, they didn't receive us. Let's call down fire. And Jesus says, you don't even know what spirit you're of. 
They're in the boat. They're getting ready to drown. And Jesus wakes up. And as soon as he's finished stilling the waves, he starts rebuking them for their lack of faith. Like, we were going to die. What did you expect us to do? What do you think he expected them to do? That's right. They had been with him. They had cast out devils already by that time. He expected them to rise up because he had said before they even got in the boat, let us get into the boat and go to the other side. So Jesus said, no, no, I didn't say let us get into the boat and drown. He said, let's get in the boat and go to the other side. So he expected them to go, no, no, this ain't happening. Wind stop. Jesus needs a nap. And then when Peter, in an other instance, gets out of the boat and actually becomes the only recorded person at that time, there have been others since, but at that time he becomes the only person to walk on water. Eleven Frady cats sitting in the boat, shivering, and Peter's out there walking on the waves. And then he takes his eyes off Jesus and begins to sink, and Jesus reaches and pulls him up out of the water and goes, good try. Did you know you're the only person other than me to walk on water? I'm so proud of you. Way to go. Is that what he says? Come on, church. What does he say? Peter, why did you doubt? Why? See, because Jesus is the truth, and he's the light that comes in, and his expectations on you and I, in view of the cross and what he has done, and in view of the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwelling on our mortal bodies, his expectations are high. You're like, yeah, but that's not fair. It's not about fair. It's about God is just, and his power is enough. His power is enough for us to live out everything that he has decreed for us to live out, for us to walk out. Now, if we are broken, if we are hurting, then we need to get some counseling. We need to get some prayer ministry. We need to get that in there to help remind you of who you are, like Vivian was prophesying this morning. But the focus isn't, oh, poor, poor me. The focus is let's get our eyes off of ourselves and off of the devil and back onto the Lord. Come on, church. Get our eyes back onto the Lord and magnify him. Don't magnify the problem. Don't magnify my constraints or my weaknesses. Magnify the Lord because he is worthy of my focus and he is worthy of my attention. And as I begin to praise him, the chains of this prison, whatever prison, maybe it's a financial prison, maybe it's a physical illness prison, maybe it's persecution like Paul and Silas, but that prison will be shaken by your praise to God will set up a divine resonance between heaven and earth because God's not up in heaven looking at your situation going, oh, oh what are we going to do? God is up there looking down and going, I'm about to do something amazing. I am glorious. I have a solution. I have an answer for this situation. And when you begin to come into agreement with that perspective, then you begin to sing the same song. Ooh, it's like the wine glass. There's a shattering of your prison because it can't stand up to the word of God. The word of God is true, and God will deliver you out of whatever challenge that you are facing. But we must love the truth. We must want to know the truth above all things. Mike Bickle said this. Um, he had this profound encounter with the Lord <coughs> in which the Lord basically said, just because you're the most on fire person you know in your little sphere doesn't mean that you should compare yourself with others. And to quit yourself of any further responsibility because you think you're better than the people you're around. The standard is not other people. The standard is Christ. The standard is Christ. And at the moment, you are watering down the standard of Christ. And you're in danger. And he came to him. And after that experience, Mike Bickle began to pray this prayer. And he said, Lord, shock me now. Shock me now. Whenever I need to be shocked, please, I plead with you, I beg you, shock me now. Don't shock me then. Because now I have opportunity to change. Now I have opportunity to repent. I have opportunity to bring my life into alignment if it is out of alignment. And there's maybe times when God looks at where you're standing in faith in spite of your weaknesses and other things, and he says, no, no, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Why? Because we are, we are living out the fullest um, expression of the revelation that we currently have. We're walking in the fullness of all that we currently know. We might be making huge mistakes, and I've told you stories about having people in this church who were fresh off the street and just barely on the verge of even thinking about getting saved. And when we began to share the gospel with them, their response was, F. 
And the Lord spoke to me and said, don't correct him. That's praise. He's actually praising me. See, that's how merciful God is. He looks at our situation. And he does, he's not legalistic in judging and saying, well, you're, you're not as good as this person, so I'm going to judge you there. No, he's always looking at the heart. Is the heart's trajectory in any way moving toward God? And if it is, God's encouraging it. Yeah, that's right. Come closer. That's just my, uh, my um, notification so I know how far I'm in. Because otherwise I'll just get carried away. And, just, and I'll just go. <coughs> Praise the Lord. So in Luke chapter 6, Jesus says, but why do you call me Lord, Lord? Verse 46, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you whom he is like. He's like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently against that house and could not shake it, for it was founded on the rock. But the one who heard and did nothing is like a man who built his house on the earth without a foundation against which the stream beat vehemently and immediately it fell and the ruin of that house was great. I don't want to be the second man. If I'm building on sand, I don't want the Lord to wait until I've got the whole house built and have been living there for 10 years before he comes and tells me, by the way, that's not good. As soon as I start building on the wrong foundation, I want the Lord to come and go, stop. Is anybody in here in the same place? Do you love the truth? Do you want to know the truth even if the truth is uncomfortable, even if the truth is unpleasant, even if, not even, because the truth will require godly sorrow and repentance, do you want to know the truth? I want to know the truth. I must live in the truth. I hate, I hate fantasy. I hate living in a fantasy, the idea that I might be living a certain way, thinking everything's fine. Like the church in Laodicea, what did they say? Man, we're good. Like, look, look, we got money, we're, we're, we're well increased in goods, we have need of nothing, they said. They actually thought that. They actually probably thought, look at all the blessings we have. These must be indicators of his favor. And Lord says, no, they're actually markers of my patience. I'm being patient with you. Many people mistake the favor of God, or m mistake the patience of God for his favor. And if God is looking at anything in my life, and guys, let's be real. Jesus writes a letter to seven churches in the book of Revelation, and five of them get a rebuke. And I mean a serious rebuke. You know, Laodicea is told, like, if you don't fix, if you don't buy gold, refine in the fire, and repent, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. I'm going to vomit you out. Whatever that means, it's not good. Another church gets told, um, I'm going to remove your lampstand from its place. Another church gets, gets told, the church in Thyatira, you better repent of tolerating Jezebel because I'm going to kill her children with death and cast her and those who commit sin with her on a bed of intense suffering. There's all of these warnings. And at the same time, not so much the church in Laodicea, but the other churches, Smyrna and Thyatira, and they get commended for some things, but then they get corrected for others. And those are significant corrections. It's not like Jesus is like, this is sort of an optional thing. I'm going to bring this to you, and if you guys want to change, that's okay, but don't really, don't really worry about it. That's not what he's saying. He's going, I, I appreciate this about you. The, you, you, know, you have um, continued, and your latter works are even more than your first works, but I have this against you. You've left your first love or, or whatever it would be. And I want to be one who says, Lord, please come and speak to us and tell us whatever you need to tell us. Because, and, and if we have to go through some pain between now and when we get to heaven, so long as when I get to heaven, I can say, I have finished the course. I have fought a good fight. I have kept the faith. And there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. And also for transformed church and its members and its intercessors and its prayers and its servants and its children's church workers and worshipers, there is laid up for us a crown of righteousness. Why? Because we have loved his appearing. We have loved it when the light of his truth has shone in. Even if it caused temporary pain, we know that it is producing eternal right standing with God. As we listen to his word and we come into agreement with his word. James chapter 1, <clears throat> verse 21 says, Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your soul. The word. Jesus is the word made flesh. And he's constantly speaking to us. He's speaking to us this morning. He's speaking through Brian. He's speaking through Vivian's prophecy. He's speaking right now. And if we receive with meekness, which is humility, not, well, I don't really think. No, that's not meekness. If, he's re if we're receiving with humility the word, the Bible says this word is able to save our souls. 
And he says in verse 22, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty. Oh, guys, this is such deep and profound truths. He who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work this one will be blessed in what he does. We have been, I don't even have time to get into it, but scripture talks about we have been set free from being slaves to sin that we might become slaves to righteousness. That we, because you're going to serve somebody, and it's not just Bob Dylan who said that. It's the Lord. We're either going to serve our flesh, which is also then serving Satan's agenda, or we're going to serve the Lord. We're going to serve other people, which is, again, not serving the Lord. We can Either serve the Lord or anything else, but we can't do both. We cannot serve two masters. And hearing and doing what he is telling us is serving the Lord. And that is what we are called to do. And that is what he has set us free to do. He who looks into the perfect law of liberty. What's the perfect law of liberty? The word. He who looks into the mirror of the Bible and sees what manner of man he is. Because, oh, I am a Christian a little Christ growing, hopefully. And I am to walk as Jesus walked. And what he says is important, I am to regard as important. And I am to order my life according to his life. And that is the freedom that we have been set free. Jim Caviezel said this. He says, we are not free to do what, we don't have the right to do what we want. As Christians, we now have the freedom to do what we ought to do. We were not free to do what we ought to do before. We were bound by sin, bound by fears and selfishness and addictions and all sorts of habits of behavior that this carnal body was was, was a prison. But now that Christ has come in, we are free to love, to serve, to forgive, to give generously, as we heard from Mike. We are free to do those things because we're not under bondage anymore. We're not under fear. It doesn't mean that we're free to just be lawless. As some in the Christian church are preaching that we're free to be lawless. Now, I don't have to do what anybody tells me to do. It's just me and God. Oh, you know what that is? That's, did God really say? That's the entrance of the enemy in there. And it's actually serving the carnal nature. Because the carnal nature doesn't like to be told what to do. Our old man doesn't like it. And our spirit man rejoices in submission to his authority. So what should be on our bucket list? I'm going to skip to that. I mean, we've got these other things, skydive and, you know, make money and degrees of education. And I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with those, but I hope those aren't at the top of your bucket list. In view of the scriptures that we read, in view of the commands of Jesus, a Pharisee came to Jesus and he said, you know, Jesus asked him, he said, what what are the greatest commands? And he says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And we learn in scripture later on, it says, he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. There's two laws, love the Lord and love others. And then we have some practical outworkings of that. Jesus gets very specific in that first scripture that I read, and he tells us what loving others looks like. Loving others at some point should look like feeding the hungry. Loving others should involve giving water to the thirsty. Loving others should involve giving people who don't have clothing, clothing. Loving others means visiting those who are sick. Loving others means visiting people who are in prison. And Jesus said loving others means taking in strangers. So I don't know about you, But I find myself reading this list about these two groups of people who end up standing before God on Judgment Day. And some of them might have a bucket list and they think, I crossed off all of my things on the bucket list. But were Jesus' commands on your bucket list? There's a group of people there, and I hope none of us in this room would be that group of people. But I'm going to suggest to you that it's very easy to determine whether or not you will be one of those people or not on the basis of, have you given food to people who are hungry? Well, spiritual food. No, natural food. 
Have you fed hungry people? Have you given water to thirsty people? Have I given clothes to people who don't have clothes? Have I visited the sick? Have I visited people in prison? Have I shown hospitality to strangers? I mean, just on the basis of that one scripture, wouldn't that be terrible for any of us to end up standing before God going, oh, wait, wait, like you actually meant like actually do those things? What, I didn't actually do those things. I didn't think you really meant that. Which would indicate that we've been listening to that voice that says what? Did God really say? Well, he didn't really mean that you actually had to like give hungry people food. He didn't really mean that you actually had to like, you know, share your clothing. I mean, that's just one scripture. But I started thinking about this and I thought, you know what? Lord, I want to tremble at your word. And I want to go and be an instrument of your love and your mercy to people who are sick. So consequently, I've done a fair bit of visiting people in hospital. And I would encourage you, church, do that. Maybe not even in hospital. Maybe if they're just at home sick, take them a meal. Practical. Ken said this. He said, the Lord spoke to him and said, my kingdom is intensely practical. We overcomplicate it. We overcomplicate it. We take... God's word not seriously enough but you know what life groups are an amazing way because in life groups you know what those people they kind of believe what you believe for the most part (laughs) you're preaching to the choir like I mean if you're sharing and you know like if, if, if we can do those things within the context of family then I think that's a great training ground for us to begin to stretch our legs so that we can begin to do these things you know with strangers out there with the lost that are going to come in, with the disciples that by his grace we are going to make when the Lord next pours out his spirit on us, which we're all contending for. Amen? We're all contending for the pouring out of his spirit again, but then it's going to require practical things that we do, and it's important that you know in your heart that you are actively engaged in doing the things that Jesus said are important to him when we stand before him on the day. Please, I want to ask every single person here to go through that scripture and read it and honestly ask yourself, have I done this? Do I have any plans to do these things? Do I have any plans to visit people who are sick? Because Jesus is saying here, it's important to me that you do that. Do I have any plans to visit people who are in prison? Do I have any plans to give food to the hungry, water to the thirsty, and clothes to the naked. What about taking in strangers? I mean, that's kind of scary. You think, what, like, what, what do you mean? Like, taking a stranger? What if they rob you? But I'm trembling before the word of God because I don't want to come up there and go, oh, you actually meant it. Now, there's a couple of other things we're going to look at as well that Jesus has given that are his commands because that's what scripture says, go into all the world and make disciples, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. And it's all summed up in loving God and loving others. So what does loving God look like? Well, loving God means worshiping him. Worship God in spirit and in truth. And I've got a bunch of verses, uh, you can have my notes if you want, that talk about whoever offers praise glorifies me. So when we walk in here this morning and the worship band is up there doing everything that they can to create an atmosphere, I want to worship God. If the sound is good, awesome. If it's not, I don't care, God's still worthy. I want to worship him because he says that he's seeking people to worship him in spirit and in truth. And spirit and truth means that we're filled with his Holy Spirit and our lives are lining up with the words that we're singing. And I'm crying out, Lord, make me more like you and let these words that I'm singing become my truth and become my reality. So worshiping God is a command that we have. Prayer, we're commanded to pray. Prayer is communion with God, including listening. We know the parable of, not the parable, the story of Jesus with Mary and Martha. And Martha, sorry, Mary sat at his feet listening. It's important that we listen so that we can clearly hear the specific rhemas. That means the now revealed words that God is giving to each one of us. Like, maybe it's time to move, Alistair and Judy. Whatever he's saying to us, we need to set aside time to listen That's important that we would obey that command. That we should, Psalm 76, 11, pay our vows to the Lord. It says, make vows to the Lord and pay them. Devoting time to intimacy with the Lord through the Holy Spirit. Psalm 91, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High. Embracing the fear of the Lord that we might know intimate friendship. Psalm 25, 14 and James 14, 13 to 17 says, the friendship of God is with those who fear him. 
consecration, sanctification, separation, 1 Thessalonians 4, 3. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification. Come apart from them, be separate, touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. This is how we love God, by consecrating ourselves to him, by being in the world but not of the world, by being separate from how the world views and does things. That doesn't mean that you can't go to a hockey game or play disc golf, but it better not supersede the Lord's priorities in your life. The Lord must be first and must be evident to be first. It's one thing to say, well, you're first, but then your life doesn't indicate that, or my life doesn't indicate that. Keeping oneself unspotted from the world, that's James 1.27. These are the commands of Jesus. Bridling the tongue, James 1.26. It says, if any man thinks he is religious, and that word religious there means if any man thinks he has the fear of the Lord, but does not put a watch on his lips then his religion is worthless. We must be careful what we speak. That was a, a big part of the focus during the, the week of prayer and fasting, that there would be no criticism, grumbling, complaining, backbiting, slander that would be proceeding from our mouths. These things are important to the Lord. Reading the word, not primarily to understand, but to obey. It's good if we understand it, but our first goal in reading the Word is not just to amass knowledge. Oh, great, yeah, I, I know everything about what it says I'm supposed to do. Have you done any of it? Well, none. No, <laughs> that's not the goal. The goal is to read in order to obey. And then 2 Timothy 2 says, studying to show oneself approved unto God in order to be able to rightly divide the Word of truth. So that's what the first commandment looks like. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Loving others. Love one another. Preach the gospel and make disciples. That's the great commission. It's also his commandment. Why? Because he loves other people as much as he loves you and me. He doesn't want them to go to hell any more than he wanted you or me to go to hell. He's aching for them to come into the kingdom. And when other things crowd out preaching the gospel and making disciples, he's not happy. People say God is in a good mood. Actually, the word of God says that the Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. So scripture says that God is patient and loving, but it also says in Psalms that he's angry with the wicked every day. So he's not in a good mood and he's not moody. We cannot ascribe to God human emotional characteristics in that sense of, well, yeah, he's having a good day. He's having a bad day. God is not affected by moods. Aren't you glad? <laughs> Aren't you glad God's not moody? Praise the Lord. And he is gracious and compassionate and slow to anger, but he does get angry. And scripture tells us that many times. So we must preach the gospel. We must forgive one another. Matthew 18, the parable of the, of the one servant who was forgiven a great debt and then would not forgive his fellow servant a much lesser debt. And Jesus said he was ordered, it was ordered that he be turned over to the torturers until he should pay back every last cent. And then he turns to his own disciples and said, And so my father shall do to each one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. These are the words of Jesus. These are the truths of Jesus. When I read that and I actually read it and it was revelation to me, the fear of the Lord came into me and I was able to instantly forgive the people who had abused me when I was growing up. When I suddenly realized that Christ had forgiven me everything and had commanded me that I must forgive everyone who has ever hurt me or done anything wrong to me. I instantly, upon believing his word and through the fear of the Lord, I received the grace in order to forgive everyone. And I suddenly went, God, I don't want to go to hell and I don't want anybody else to go to hell either. Please forgive them. They didn't even know what they were doing. And so we, th that's where we see that loving the truth and faith in the word of God will become a far greater force in your life than the victim spirit and who hurt me in the past. And maybe you were genuinely and horribly hurt. But you know what? His blood is enough. His power is enough to set you free from hanging on to the past and the idea that, well, yeah, but they deserve justice. I don't want justice. I want mercy. I don't want judgment. I want mercy. And so I'm committed that I have to give it. Pray for one another. Encourage one another. Exhort, correct, and discipline those who are out of line in error or mistake and warn those who are falling away. I would say that it would be of great importance to make sure 
that your bucket list includes loving God in measurable ways that include worship, prayer, devotion, giving, serving, obeying his word, being set apart from the world, living clean and holy. And you can't do that by the flesh, only by the spirit, but provision has been made for you to do it by the spirit, that none of us would have an excuse not to. And loving others in measurable ways that includes feeding the hungry, giving water to the thirsty, clothing the naked or those without the ability to clothe themselves, taking in strangers and showing hospitality to those who cannot necessarily repay you. It's easy to show hospitality to our friends and family. Well, some of our friends and family. <laughs> it's a little harder to show hospitality to those who can't repay us and they may be messy. Also, important to visit the sick, those in prison, to care for widows and orphans in their distress, both natural and spiritual. You might not have any orphans running around the streets of Abbotsford naturally, but we have spiritual orphans that desperately need the care. They need the hearts of the fathers and the mothers to be turned to them, to pull them in and begin to pour into them and to disciple them. And Jesus expects us to do these things. And actually, God has made it simple which is not the same thing as easy, but rather uncomplicated, to both love him and love others. If we genuinely seek, listen, the eternal good of other people, and we depend upon his grace and his power to consistently love others in practical and visible ways, in 1 John 4, 19 to 21, the Lord tells us that by doing this, we demonstrate the genuinity and the validity of our love for him. Well, I don't know if I love God. Just start loving other people and his love will be flowing through you like a conduit. And you'll receive everything you need. You know, when I'm focused on, oh, that's a problem. I remember Patricia King said this, when, when there would be all sorts of attacks that would begin to come against her finances or their physical health, she, or, 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 or physical health she would grab a handful of tracks and just say, you want to hit me, devil? I'm going to hit back. And she would take those tracks and begin to go out in the streets and say, every time you really press me and, and pressure me, I'm going to advance the kingdom of God. And she would just begin to go and witness, and things would clear up in her life because <laughs> the devil doesn't want that kind of a response. Now, she wouldn't stop anyway, so he was damned if he did and damned if he didn't, <laughs> which is true, actually. He is damned. That's right. God has made it possible for us to live a victorious, exciting, epic Christian adventure if we will believe his word, if we will love the truth, and if we will not overcomplicate it, but if we will simply read the word and ask ourselves, have I done these things? Am I doing these things? Let the love of God flow through us to others, and we will gain a greater revelation of his love for each of us. Let's pray. Father, we don't want to be lawless. Deliver us from the mindset that questions your word and says, did God really say? Did he really mean that? Yes, you said it, you meant it. We receive it, we believe it. <coughs> Lord, we pray that what would be foremost upon our bucket lists would not be the acquisition of more material wealth, would not be the acquisition of simple status in, in, in society. Lord, education is good, but let it not eclipse the preeminence of Christ and seeking first his kingdom in our lives, Lord God. We pray that obeying you and being the light and the salt in the earth would be of utmost importance to us, Father. We pray that, that all of these things that we have read, which Jesus commanded and which he said are important to him, that we do these things, we pray that those would be at the top of our bucket lists and that we would approach them not with a legalistic or performance mindset, thinking that we can cross things off so we can get back to doing us. But Father, that these would become our passion, these would become our life, and that as we find our true identity in doing the works which were prepared in advance for us to do, for we are your workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works prepared in advance for us to do. Lord, that we might also, like Paul, be able to come to the place where we can say, I have fought a good fight, I have finished the course, I have kept the faith, and there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness because I have loved his appearing, and because I have loved his truth, and because I have believed his word. Deliver us from lawlessness, O oh God. Deliver us from independence and from the mindset that presumes to explain away your word. Let us tremble at your word with a holy 
fear and a love that is part of the same picture, Lord God. The love of God and the fear of God are two sides of the same coin. For you are awesome and holy and worthy of praise and obedience. In Jesus' precious and mighty name, amen. Praise the Lord.